Hello everybody, welcome to a British audio file. For those of you who are new to this channel, my name is Taron. I've been reflecting on why Bukhar audio speakers are so popular. I think it's something to do with the direct sales model and the perceived value that that brings, where you haven't got a distributor or dealer with their fingers in the pie. But perhaps it's also something to do with Mads Bukhar himself. He's a pretty impressive individual. It takes a lot to bring a new speaker to market and compete with the big boys. And he certainly managed to do that. And I think his commitment to customer service is second to none. But then there's the Bukhar S400 speakers themselves, which really put Bukhar Audio on the map. The Mark I model had a blend of qualities that appealed to a number of consumers. For instance, it offered all round good sound quality. Then there was the bass, which was literally jaw dropping. Quite frankly, it was staggering the amount of bass weight and extension that you were able to get from what was still a moderately sized stand mount speaker. But I think a large part of the appeal was how easy the original S400 was to live with. It was very friendly of its environment thanks to its control directivity design. And that basically in layman speak means that that waveguide was well implemented. It was also friendly of partnering equipment, especially moderately priced amplifiers. A lot of them have a lean sound and the Bukhar S400 Mark I had a warm, rich sound which balanced them out very nicely. It was also forgiving of poor recordings thanks to a top end that was a little bit recessed and rolled off. Now, I'm taking a look at the Mark II version today and I can tell you right from the off, this is a very different sounding speaker. So is it a case of what have they done or what have they done? Let's find out. The Bukhar S400 Mark II is sold direct for 2,000 euros a pair in a white finish and a black finish that were available since launch. The light oak has only been obtainable since April 2022. It's the same case with the rosewood. I have to say that the matte walnut looks stunning in my opinion on the unit that I'm reviewing today. The S400 Mark II still measures 365 by 180 millimeters, but the depth has increased by 40 millimeters to 280 millimeters due to it now being internally braced. Imperial measurements are 14.4 by 7 by 11 inches, and each speaker weighs 7.5 kilograms or 16.5 pounds. The angled front baffle still has the inverted drive arrangement of the original for better time alignment between the two drivers. That's unlike the active A500 where the drivers are the other way round because they're time aligned using DSP. The tweeter arrangement is unchanged from the Mark I. It's 0.74 inch 19 mm soft fabric dome sitting in an aluminium CDC waveguide to control directivity and achieve the seamless integration with the mid woofer that its predecessor was renowned for crossing over at 1800 Hz. Out goes the aluminium cone midwoofer and in comes a paper cone 6 inch 150 mm SB Acoustics driver that was developed for the A500. It makes sense as SB Acoustics founder Ulrich Schmidt is a former ScanSpeak employee that was involved in developing the famous paper cone revelator driver. The rear will look familiar to owners of the Mark I with one set of decent quality five-way speaker binding posts and an 8 by 5 inch passive radiator. That's the primary reason why the S400 extends down so low with an in-room response at minus 3 dBs of 33 Hz. According to Mads Bukart, an equivalent ported design would need a 30% larger cabinet. The final significant difference between the Mark I and the Mark II is that the crossover has been totally reworked with significantly upgraded parts. The Janssen air core inductors, cross caps capacitors, MOX and Super Res resistors, and you'll certainly be lucky to find the ultra high end KPCU1 MyFlex capacitor on other speaker around this price. I'm going to do something slightly different for this section. When it comes to talking about sound quality, I always include a comparison based element as part of my review. I think that's important. But on this particular occasion, I'm gonna talk about the S400 Mark II purely in terms of comparison. And the reason is 
this speaker is likely to be reviewed by all and sundry and there's going to be some conflicting information out there so I think it's important that people very clearly understand what my reference points are. The other thing I want to state is that I don't have the Mark 1 here at the same time but that is a speaker that I'm very familiar with. Mads Bukart was the first person to send me a product to review when I started this channel well over two years ago and I was fortunate enough to keep the Mark 1 S400 as a reference piece for many months afterwards. So I'm comfortable on this occasion talking about making comparisons in fairly general terms. Another speaker that I'll naturally compare it to is my long-term reference, my Product Response 1 SCs. They may be over 20 years old, but with the exception of the ATC SCM 19s, are still the best speaker that I've heard on the right side of £3,000. They also serve as a useful point of common reference between the S400 Mark I and Mark IIs. So let's get started. Does the Mark II sound like the Mark I? And the answer is no. There are some fundamental differences in sonic character. The original Mark I is a warmer, richer sounding speaker than my Product Response 1 SEs. Now both these speakers I still consider to be on the warm and romantic side of what is perfectly natural and neutral. That's because my reference at that point is the ATC SCM 19s. As for the S400 Mark II, well it sits much closer to the ATC SCM 19s than it does to my Proax and certainly is a departure from the original Mark I. But it isn't a perfectly neutral sounding speaker either. It's a little bit mid-centric in its personality. That's where your attention is drawn as opposed to the Mark I where your attention was drawn much more to the lower frequencies, the mid bass and the upper mid range which gave it that warm bass centric kind of presentation. Bass extension is similar on the Mark I and the Mark IIs. I think officially the Mark II is supposed to extend down a couple of hertz further, being a slightly larger design, but there really isn't much in it. I think most people are likely to get an in-room response in the mid to low 30s, depending on the size of their listening space. But that's where the similarities between the two end. As far as bass agility and definition is concerned, well, the original Mark I was a slower, more ponderous sounding speaker when it came to the lower registers compared to my Product Response 1 SEs. But the Mark II is actually more agile. Now, given the fact that it digs down a lot deeper as well, that's no small mean feat. And it is an exceptional trait of this particular speaker. The other thing that is noticeably different between the two when it comes to low frequency performance is bass weight or the perceived bass weight. The Mark I had a perceived hump in the mid bass, which gave it a real punchy, toe tapping party type of sound. That isn't the case with the Mark II. It's much more in balance with the rest of the sonic presentation. There's a big difference in overall clarity between the S400 Mark II and its predecessor, which shows itself most in the mid range. Whereas the Mark I was quite a bit softer, especially when it came to transient response, but also glossed over fine details compared to my Product Response 1 SCs, the Mark II is much closer. Okay, it's not quite as good when it comes to revealing textures and clarity and openness in the mid-range as my Proax, but then that is a Proact Response 1 SC thing, but the Delta is much, much closer. The soundstage width is excellent in all three of these speakers that I've been talking about. Whereas the Bukar S400 Mark I's present the sound in line with the speakers with a touch of soundstage depth, the Mark II's present the sound in line with the speakers but with lead instruments and lead vocals projected forward slightly. And that's because there is a little bit of emphasis in the upper mid-range. As far as my products are concerned, well, they have a much deeper soundstage with more precise imaging. They're still unsurpassed in that regard. Now, I'm hesitating for a moment because I've undenied about whether I should include this in this review. People jump on anything negative, so please try and keep this in context. There is a touch of hardness in the upper mid-range to the Bukar S400 Mark IIs, but it's something I think that very few people will pick up on just for those who are sensitive in that area. I happen to be one of those people. The high frequencies are another major step forward for the Mark IIs compared to the Mark I's. Surprising to me how many speakers, even at this price, don't get it right, either sounding bright and aggressive or dark and recessed. And dark and recessed is what you got with the Mark 1s. 
upper harmonics of female vocals, symbols, etc. just weren't fully realized and rendered correctly. That is no longer the case with the Mark IIs. It's supremely well judged. The high frequency extension has an air and openness to it, but without any hint of brightness or aggression. That does also play into how these speakers match up to partner equipment, which I'll get into next. The exemplary off-axis performance of the Mark I is carried over to the Mark IIs, and that manifests itself in a very even tonal balance as you walk around the room. For that reason, I think it will work well in a wide variety of acoustic settings. You can get away with placing the Mark IIs a little closer to the wall than you can with the Mark Ones. That's because the bass is tighter and more clearly defined. But if you want to get your money's worth, pull them out from the walls. Maintain the three feet or 90 centimeters minimum that I talk about in other videos. If you want to know the reason why, check out my video on speaker setup. It's not really suitable as a near field monitor. That waveguide means that the tweeter is further away from the midwoofer than would ordinarily be the case. So maintain a distance of around six feet. You do need to place them on slightly higher stands than would ordinarily be the case for a speaker around this size. And that's because the tweeter is at the bottom. Ideally, I think you want to take the equidistant point in the middle of the two drivers and imagine a perpendicular line pointing directly off the front baffle to your ears. It's not the first choice of speaker that I'd use for late night quiet listening, but it does fare better than the Mark I in that regard, and that's because it has better clarity and better top end extension. It's not as forgiving of poor recordings and poor partner equipment either, and that's what you get if you want higher fidelity. I tried it with a number of amplifiers. This is how I got on. The SMSL VMV A2 that retails for around 800 pounds is a class D amplifier capable of delivering 200 watts per channel into a four ohm load. That's what we have here with the S400s, a four ohm load. I thought it might work quite well given that Bucar Audio produced their own class D amplifier it is based on a much more expensive Hypex Encore module though. It didn't. The A2 sounded flat and dull, even though it is a very detailed sounding amplifier. It's not just about the watts. It's also about current driving capability. And that's what I think the issue was. It might seem silly to pair it up with the £399 IOTA VX SA3, but I know some people who use that with the S400 Mark 1s. It is my reference for an amplifier at a relatively accessible price, and I just wanted to see how the two of them would get on. It did okay, a little bit better than the A2, but quite frankly, the S400 Mark IIs are too revealing of the shortcomings in terms of refinement and drive in that amplifier. As far as I can recall, the Mark I's fared a little bit better. They're a less revealing speaker and glossed over some of those shortcomings a little bit more effectively. Going through my current crop of reference amplifiers, the excellent Exposure 2510 was a much more price appropriate match at around £1,600. Plenty of drive, grip and control, but despite being my amplifier of the year in 2021, it wasn't my favourite choice of amplifier with these particular speakers, even around this price. And that's because that touch of upper mid-range prominence that could delve into the feeling of hardness occasionally that was a little bit more obvious with this particular combination. So let's jump in at over double the price with the Hegel H190 at £3,300 and 250 watts of power into 4 ohms. Now just before you accuse me of going overboard, you should be aware that Mads Bukar himself regularly uses this amplifier to evaluate the S400s, or he did with the previous model, I'm sure he has with this one as well. And it shows the synergy between the two was very, very good. It had more scale, more rhythm, more drive, and a wider sound stage than what I got with the Exposure 2510. And the tonal balance was spot on as well. But that wasn't my favorite combination. It was the Wilsington R8 with the upgraded PS Vane tubes, which is yours for around 1500 pounds in the UK once you've accounted for shipping and taxes. It delivered what the Hegel did, but where the Hegel can be accused occasionally of playing things safe, the upgraded Wilsington with the right speakers is a big, bold, ballsy, warm, rich sounding amplifier. And that's exactly what I got with this combination. 
Mads Bukar and his team have taken an already good sounding S400 to another level in terms of clarity and refinement. Sure there's going to be people out there who are going to prefer the warm laid back tonal balance of the original and the fact that it's more forgiving of partner equipment and poor recordings but those people should also be aware that they can't have their cake and eat it. When it comes to pure fidelity there's no debate here the S400 Mark II is a significant improvement and it comes very highly recommended by this channel. My question for today is what's your experience as you upgrade your hi-fi about how fussy it is with regards to partner equipment and the music that you play through it? I love to hear your views in the comments section. And I just want to talk about my Patreon for a second. We have these video meetings from time to time where we have people join with different levels of experience. There's no agenda. We just chat hi-fi stuff. It's a lot of fun. If you think that's your bag, you might want to check that out. The link's in the description. And the last thing I'd like to say is if you haven't already, you like what I'm doing and you want to see this channel grow, please do that social media stuff. But for today, for now, British Audiophile, signing off.